Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to the uh, definitive and comprehensive uh, course uh, for uh, for budding uh, comic scholar that is titled as decoding comic studies and reading graphic uh, narratives in 21st century right so what i have been what we have been doing in this lecture is talking about comics culture to understand the entire idea of what comic culture is academically we have been looking at the definition we have been looking at the history we are looking the theories the people who are very much associated with this and also their contribution and how comic medium is very much different and unique from other kind of a form of art so today we are going to talk about not uh, I mean in details, decopes, trissas and hyperframe. So you remember uh, in the last class, I left you with the, the term decopes, trissas and hyperframe and I also explained you a bit that what do these terms mean to us or how are they understood in comic studies. Today, I am going to discuss these terms again for you and we are going to look at certain examples that will elaborate these terms beautifully and also we will look at the contribution which we have been talking in the last two lectures about the Grand Steen's book and his new way to talk about comic studies or no, sorry to talk, talk about comic mediums all right so before we get into the direct idea for decoppers to size and hyperframe we need to also understand that there are certain terms which are associated with certain discipline for a particular reason that is that they define they try to understand in which way we are going to travel in this academics or in this uh, course so here we have uh, three terms and uh, i deliberately show you these pics again and again for a particular reason that whenever uh, i'm going to speak you keep these pictures or this entire frame in your mind so uh, as I told you in the last class let me just revise it that decoupage is translated as a breakdown gets used fairly loosely throughout the work signifying the way a page is broken down into discrete units the piecing together of those units the indissolubility of the page work itself as well as the basic breaking down of the movement inherent in sequentiality so and that is what called restricted arthrology i am sure that it is refreshing your memory so and trissage is translated as a braiding that signifies something similar both the generation of a meaning through the layering of discrete units and the division of a meaning into discrete panels threads and layers and the hyperframe is the page itself in which all the units coexist all right so to understand the two types of orthology a little better, a special orthology refers to the sequence itself, the strip, the sequential definition of a comics occupies no more than 40 pages of the system. The majority of the book is devoted instead to the definition of the spatio-topical system 
which then provide the building blocks of the final chapter on general arthology. General arthology is the multi-layered meaning of a text. When I am saying text, what I mean? Comic. Erected through the oscillation between tresas and decopas, or rather through the tresas of decopas and vice versa. General arthology creates a connection across a given page, not just between adjacent panels. It can even be extended to the relationship between elements on non-adjacent pages, which Brenstein calls teleorthology. Teleorthology, which means braiding thus manifest into consciousness the notion that the panels of a comic constitute a network, even a system. To the syntagmatic logic of the sequence, it imposes another logic, the associative. Through the bias of a teleorthology, images that the breakdown holds at a distance, physically and contextually independent, are suddenly revealed as communicating closely in debt to one another. Alright, so what interestingly we see, what Granstein is referring to, the very idea of a teleorthology. Let me give you an example before I uh, move further, right. Let us say for example, when you are reading a particular comic book. So, you see as I have been repeatedly talking about that you have to give or understand all the minute details that is available on the page. It suggests that everything available on the page is trying to say you something, is trying to speak to you something. The author has deliberately brought certain image, certain uh, pictures, certain words on the page so that when you read you can recall something. Let me give you an example. Let us say for example, when you are reading uh, uh, let us say a text in Hindi or in English and suppose there is a reference to world war, it simply suggests immediately in your, in, in your mind the entire context and history of the world war gets pictured and then you relate it with, you understand that something is going to happen or bad or good, you relate with the image that is brought in your mind by writing something on the pages. Teleorthology is the almost like this that it is maybe not written in detailed way, but by talking about something even at once is trying to give a kind of understanding to you that something is new or something that you have already familiar with has its connection, right. When I will move ahead, you will understand. So, let me show you the example, right. So, look at this slide and you see that a more familiar example is Alison Wechdel, so comic memoir that is a fun home. Look at the title, a family tragedy comic which means there is a going to be element of a tragedy and also there is a going to be element of a comic, right is one of the, this fun home, a family tragic comic is one of the most popular comics to teach at the college level, right. So, I would suggest to you, right, I would suggest to you that whenever you go, please read in for the next class when I am, uh, uh, if I end this lecture before we meet for the next lecture, I would suggest to you that Please try to read some pages of a Fun Home, a family tragicomic by Alison Bechdel. So, what Grenstein is trying to explain you with the, like what he is trying to talk about the teleorthology, you can easily understand when you, if you have read or if you have not read, please read this book called 
a fun home fun home a family tragic comic all right so let's look at the story now which i i mean not the entire story i'm going to talk about but at least what connects with what is related with teleorthology right so to understand i mean uh, to understand grunstein's idea using the works of alison bechdel like one of the pioneer of i would say let me write it for you you can remember and also if you are interested in exploring something queer studies or uh, interested in uh, the idea of a queer uh, thinking or queer discourse through the comic medium you can read him and uh, he is a pioneer of uh, modern queer comics okay so always remember this Alison Bechdel is also known for introducing modern queer comics so the first page that is available on your screen the first page includes a remarkable level of a complexity what is that a young elision young elision and her father right her father play a game of airplane in which he propels her into the air on his feet a textbook informs us, informs us that such acrobatics are called ik ikarian sorry let uh, let me spell it correctly ikarian games right such acrobatics are called ikarian games alerting us to a series of references that will occur throughout the book which means ikaras dedlus joyous besides her father lies the book he had just been reading anna karenina right here you see just let me show you you see this one anna karenina right anna karenina and i'm sure that you all know that this book is written by leo tolus toy the very famous novelist it is a well known opening line alerts the reader that the coming story will be of a family unhappy in its own way right those who are very familiar with the story of anna karenina they know that something unhappy going to happen throughout the page we see restrained orthology in the movement across adjacent panels and general orthology in the ties between non adjacent panels so you see between the first and the third panel in which we connect the book right and outside the book to an entire ecology of myth and literature icarus joyce or tolstoy so let me read it for you like many fathers mine could occasionally be prevailed on for a spot of airplane okay as he launched me my full weight would fall on the pivot point between the feet and my stomach oof it was a discomfort well worth the rare physical contact and certainly worth the moment of a perfect balance when i soared above him in the circus acrobatics where one person lies on the floor balancing another are called icarian games right this is what you read so what happens when we look at this kind of a book right interestingly we see that in we, we see the uh, the images where we see that the child and a father is playing with each other and then we remember okay this is a game called airplane and then we get certain references and that is how it goes so here you see it is a restricted orthology but at the same time general orthology is also into play which means that the first and the third are in sync with each other right not the second one first and second panel so look at the slides i think that will make you uh, uh, more comfortable in understanding and then interestingly what you see the book that lies beside the father is the novel called anna karenina 
समटाइम वॉट वी डू वी डोंट वी ओवर लोकेटेड we don't understand and we, we we don't pay attention that there is a particular purpose for which it is there we see it is just lies there that's it it has nothing to do with uh, moving the story further or uh, it has to do something with the story or certain themes or certain issues right at the same time we also see ecrarian right ecrarian ecarus is a myth and then we think of a james joyce then we think of a deadless so here you see myth history is also in play so something not available but actually is available and <clears throat> that is what i call or like grenstein is calling teleorthology and if we don't understand then obviously we won't be able to understand the entire comics right this book so this is what i wanted to bring to your notice but it is not end let's let's look at uh, the slide again here what do you see you see icarian games so the final page of the comics is similarly complex though it contains only two sentences right only two sentences bechdel has just wondered what if icarus had not hurtled into the sea what if he had inherited his father's inventive bent what might he have wrought this is a page number 231 you will see okay which is not there and the final page answers he did hurtle into the sea of course right he did hurtle into the sea of course plastered across the grill of the truck that killed her father bechdel offers one more panel for reprieve on top of a panel depicting her leaping from a diving board into her father's waiting arms that is what we read but in the tricky reverse narration that impels our intwined stories he was there to catch me when i left of course we know that he was not there right what is the line he was there to catch me when i left but we know that he was not there he died in a sense just when she needed him most but through the their story like but through their shared love of books he lived on to comfort and guide her and still does across time she still jumps and he still catches they play across the pages of books what is most striking thou is the parallelism this is what you must be familiar with right parallelism between the two pages on the first page elison is patched on her father's feet about to fail on the last page he is about to catch her right you see that on the first page was what we notice that elison is perched on her father's feet about to fall on the last page he is about to catch her the framing of the panel this one and this one is stresses the connection it also imitate the connection she had with her father on one based on intertextuality and common sexual frustration and exploration and this is what we called tele arthrology reaching from the first page of the book to the last right first page of the book to the last page is something what we see through the network so it also indicates that intertextuality intertextuality is a kind of a tele orthology right so now you i'm sure that you understood with this examples what i wanted to explain to you all right so indeed in the final page of bechdel's follow up memoir are you my mother 
right? This is an exa another example that I wanted to bring to you. A comic drama, you see, are you my mother? Look at the title itself. There is a question mark, right? A comic drama. Bechdel creates another parallel to these two panels. Bechdel's mother is largely absent from Fun Home, but Bechdel wrote Fun Home largely through conversation with her. Are you my mother? This uh, uh, comic drama present that story with all the difficulties inherent in talking with a parent about the pain and trauma of a childhood. So, you look at this. On the final page, Bechdel recounts a game she played with her mother in which she would pretend to be crippled and her mother would help her get around. The final page presents her father's mother's failing with brutal honesty, but also argues for the importance of being taught to help oneself, even if it is being given some help along the way. And of course, it is in communication with those panels from Pan Home, instead of a father holding her aloft precariously or ready to catch her as she falls, we see a mother offering a modicum of a care, a good enough mother to borrow Wins, uh, 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 Winnicott's phrase as Joyce was to Fun Home, Winnicott is the central literary character of Are You My Mother? But the visual parallels are there. Indeed, it almost looks as though her mother is about to become the airplane. Alison will support on one page on the next. It looks as though her mother has dropped her. Rather than being supported in play, Alison is depicted as wounded and in need of a care and her mother offers just enough. Though their relationship seems cold and distant at times, we have discovered that it is full of love and shared wounds. Whether called a gutter or orthology, the same principle that connects one panel to the another or text with image can make connections across book and people, right. So, I am sure that what I explained to you, you must have understood, right. Here you see on the one panel, just to explain, look at this, Annie and a special shoes, but I am sure my mom indulged many such play scenario with me, why is this the one that I recall, okay. Let me list them up, you see the concern and the care, Le okay, let me less them up. I can only speculate that there was a charge, an exchange, a mutual cathexis going on. She could see my invisible wounds because they were hers too. You see, it is full of emotions, love, attachment, care, right. Look at this image, look at the line and now when we see the end one, what we find here. If we look at the uh, image, what interestingly we recall, it looks like that the baby was pushed by her mother herself, right. The image is such a way that she is angry and she is the one who has pushed her. Here the baby, all of a the child is looking for care and concern, right. He, she or he, she wants her mother to help her, but here you see it looks like she is not going to help, right. But the way it goes further, so here you see that if you, the point what I am making, I am not going to explain you the entire uh, story, the point what I am making is that there is a connection with this and with this right. That is exactly the point I was thinking of making, right. First and the last has a connection. If we do not see this, we do not understand this, all right. So, the system of a comics is Thierry Gernstein's most fully realized contribution to Franco-Belgian comics theory and its recent translation into English offers new mode and discursive practices for American comics theory, which was rarely engaged the formal aspects of the medium. 
Gwenstein vehemently opposes methods of deconstructing the comic panels into basic element instead championing the semiotic study of a comics as an interdependence of images operating together to produce articulation. Gwenstein examines this apparatus on the level of spatiotopia, the spatial locative layout of a page and then through its sequential or networked orthology relation that create mechanism of a meaning with the system of a comics theory Gronstein brings comics into the field of semiotics and creates a new analytic framework and vocabularies for the medium. Within each of the three chapters Gronstein articulates the formal elements comprising a preponderantly visual language in which text plays a subordinate role. His subject heading correspond to the two predominant forms of the comic structure, especially your topical evaluation of a comic system, stress the importance of space and place determining how the aesthetic effect of a panel, gutter, frame and margin location are central to the operative logic of a comics. By orthology, Gronstein creates a neologism, neologism from the Greek arthon means articulation to refer to the study of relation between panels within his system iconic solidarity is the foundation upon which is up, upon which is structured an organic totality that associates a complex combination of elements parameters and multiple procedures all right so what Granstein is doing through this right because now what I will do in this uh, uh, coming uh, uh, next 30 to 40 minutes I will show you the slides and I will speak about it for a particular reason that so far what we uh, thought what I thought is a difficult in explaining or uh, or which I thought is a difficult for you to understand I have already explained. Now what I am going to do in next 30 minutes possibly to show you the slides and explain that what they refer to and what they understand. But one thing before we go back to the slides, as we understood that these neologism are there to talk about something which comics is doing with us, but possibly we are not able to understand or which we have ignored or which we have overlooked. So as you saw orthology, author, which means articulation, which means a study of articulation if I put it a very simple way in a crude manner just to explain you which means how something is articulated to you right a study of articulation which means how something is speaking to you how what are the ways or the medium are brought at one place so that something can communicate with you right so therefore we have to read the theory so that we can understand that how comics communicate with us, how comics speak with us, how comics have brought different mechanism so that it can be it can be articulated. All right. So moving back to the slides now, you see that categorizing comics as a language, Grunstein rejects any attempts to reduce comics to group of component element. He is especially wary of those scholars who employ a static film theory to study comics, remapping the cell or a scene of a film onto the panel of a comics. In this critical assessment, Gronstein identifies a grand oversight of the uniquely imaginative and subjective experience that the comic book reader undergoes through his or her engagement with the work. Gordestein cites the juxtaposition of images within comics as the primary bearer of narrative signification, although he allows that each image have its own meaning. He stresses that for comics, it is a space between panels where relationship of articulation are constructed, right? Mind this point, right? That the space between panels where relationship of relationships of articulation are constructed. An essential point 
made by Gernstein is that in the interpretation of a comic, each panel contains content, therefore it shows, but it is the linkage of a panel that says. So, this is a necessary step away from film theory based methods of a comic analysis and similarly precludes the implementation of a textual theory to account for the staging of a meaning. So, which must occur across many panels within the comic system. By recognizing the sophistication of a comics, one can observe the multivalent labels of a signification that combine to convey aesthetic or narrative effect. Alright, so the idea is that most of the time we look at or we start to read comics as if it is nothing but a film. So, to a certain extent, yes, it operates like a film, but to a large extent also it does not operate like a film. The particular reason what Granstein is explaining that articulation, the relationship of articulation is possible when there is a, we have like the relationship of articulation is possible within the gap from one panel to the another panel, which means space between one panel to the another panel. But that does not happen in the film. We are not aware what happened in the space from one panel to the another, right? But that is where uh, comics to one, like one, from one larger point, it departs, not being called as a film, but more than something else, not a film, but departure. The departure is the gap, the space that is created from one panel to the another panel, all right? And this is where you have to see how the narrative effects takes place. That is where you have to see how aesthetic is taking place, all right? So, moving to the next slide, what you see here that using the iconic solidarity within and without the panel as the base unit for his system, Granstein writes at length of the ways that framing and placement determine how panel functions as an utterable and the primary panel of the three tired staging of a meaning in comics. Panel in triad composes the syntagm of Gernstein's second plane where informed interpretation begins. The reader must take into account that which precedes and succeeds the present panel and begin to construct semantic relations as in retroactive determination where a reader does not understand a panel without the information articulated in the next. In the sequence of a panel, the third plane unfolds to signify further contribution to narrative or aesthetic meaning. The page layout and breakdown or the linear spatial and temporal designation for these meanings while Discontinuous networks of correspondence between panels create the general orthology of the work. So, to revise further within a general orthology, Gernstein further distinguishes between gridding and breeding, right? Gridding is simply the way a page is broken. Gridding is a simply the way a page is broken up especially, right? So, let me uh, 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 write it for you that is something like let us say for example, gridding which is called quadrilage and then we have a braiding which is nothing but almost like a dressage which I have already spoken to you alright. So, gridding is simply the way a page is broken up especially less simply it is also primary rep repartition of the narrative material. Thus, gridding is a way of inspecting meaning without consideration for the content of the page. Braiding addresses the potential relation between any panels that exist as a supplement to the intelligibility of the work which is determined by its breakdown. To clarify the breakdown of a panels into a logical or narrative sequence may hold some units to physically and contextually independent. It braiding reveals the way 
these panels are associated and communicate with one another right you may also look at as a identical construction of the panel with different content or repetition of a single motif through disparate episodes so having laid the ground work for this architectonic theory Godstein concludes by excusing himself for any pragmatic drawbacks to his system and suggesting the extension of his work beyond comics toward a reassessment of many fields like narratology, media, communication studies are mentioned by name that may have failed to synthesize comic into their theories. So, Greenstein's formal approach to comics come directly from European comics theory that has seriously considered the ninth art a fertile medium for aesthetic inquiry for longer than most American academics. His book has the potential to elevate the study of a comics beyond the preliminary nature of Scott McCloud's understanding comics the invisible art and Bill Asner's comic and sequential art the foundational text for American comics theory. These books are invaluable introduction to the field at Granstein provides unparalleled theoretical structure for analysis. So, Granstein's prose has been criticized for its opacity yet one could reconsider his jargon heavy and neologism laced writing as the stylistic fulfillment of his stated goal. So, by inventing new ways of to talk about comics that do not recycle the lexicons of films and literary studies. Gernstein advances comic theory toward its independence. Terms like braiding and greeting are fuller than networking panels into series and repartitioning narrative component into units of space. So, the application of Gernstein's work is sometimes problematized by his reliance on Franco-Belgian comic example, many of which may be unknown to an Anglophone audience. It is sometimes hard to understand precisely the point that he is marking without the reproduction of a sample page. These are limited to 15 within the entire book. Additionally, Granstein's text often suffers from an overly destructive critical stance. If it devotes a considerable amount of time to dismantling and debunking previous comics theories, it is repeatedly done at the expense of developing a new model to fill the now exhibited wide. However, Gernstein's prose is evocative enough to inspire readers to perform semiotic interpretation that follow his lead. Many of Gernstein's greatest point are also his subtlest. In a careful sentence, he reveals that the tension that is created with the use of two-dimensional speech balloons in three-dimensional mimetic image. This insight certainly paves the way for investigation into what might constitute a homodiegetic narrative, right? Homodiegetic narrative within his schemism of representation. Although Granstein himself only provides brief examples, his system can be used to read virtually any comic. In film, one cannot find the same especially juxtaposed series of narrative and representative interrelation in text, one uh, uh, loses the imaginative space in between images as a site of narrative genesis. For Granstein, the language of comics cannot be translated. It will be interested, interesting to see in the adaptation of the form what meaning is lost. So, what I have been uh, talking about that the contribution of uh, uh, Granstein and more importantly that how his theory, how his ideas have developed comics. See, every theoretician has a limitations. We should never forget that, right? Every theoretician has a limitations. To understand that limitation, right? To, to follow what he has been talking about. To understand that what the problem lies within his theory. But more than that, the question we should ask, is his contribution or her contribution not important or not good enough that developed this field? And the answer would be yes. That is not that he has not contributed enough. He has contributed enough 
to develop this particular field right but when we talk about the limitations that is something i talked about so that when we are reading radistein we are supposed to be aware that what are the problem that he occupies but say that there is a limitation but we are not supposed to forget his contribution as i was talking about that bill asner or mcleod the two people who developed this field like anything we should also never forget the contribution of gernstein all right so moving to the slide now moving ahead what we see that we have seen now that since his publication in 1999 the system of a comics has been a mainstay of comic studies providing a theoretical framework upon which scholars have built an increasingly complex discourse in comics and narration grunstein expands in comics and narration grunstein expands the that framework moving from how comics work to what comics do that is a very interesting departure that you see right now in comics and narration he is not going to focus on how comics work but he is going to look at what comics do and that is something is to take from his book comics and narration all right so gernstein is uh, uh, i mean where the first book if i if i talk about the first book that was primarily concerned with the interplay of panels frames and pages the second that's important in the comics and narration focuses on the ways in which rhythm and as the title implies narration function and affect perception right that's a very uh, uh, interesting right and and very uh, 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 like very envisaging that how uh, grandstein is looking at a very different perspective where probably we have not seen so far he is asking us that so far we have been reading comics thinking about that how does it work and i'm sure that what we have been looking at it that how things are brought together so that it can it can speak to you the it can make a meaning right but how what it does to us right what comics do to us that becomes a very important a phenomena so here what we see, going to see that like look at the title it says there is a comics and narration so which means that if suppose i have to create a kind of stimulation in you a particular kind of stimulations so what kind of a narration i am going to use and suppose i am going to uh, change your perception about something obviously i have to build up i have to talk about i have to i have to experiment i have to bring forth a new kind of a narration right so here what this book is more focused on that how does narrative function and how does it affect perception and that is where you see this book called comic and narration is expanding grunstein's theories right it's moving it's taking one step ahead grunstein's theory right so look at the next point on the slide please so comics and narration broadens his theory by engaging with other critics and by attending to comic media outside the banded sesni tradition including american comic books and newspaper strips manga digital comics and children literature in his introduction grandstein is quick to acknowledge the advances made in comics studies between his first and second volumes and obviously he does pay homage to theories molder and 
Harry Morgan and other scholar who have helped to progress the field. He likewise identifies a number of advancement in the comics medium, praising his strides towards greater inclusiv inclusivity and evolving formats. But Granstein also makes notes of some areas in which further progress is necessary, especially the imperialism of the series and the hero and the outdated aesthetic standards corresponding to long gone classic period. Apparently, this book is as much a response to these failures as it is a complication of these earlier theories. So, comic and narration uh, spans eight chapters and each of which decodes a single aspect of the larger investigation at hand. And this make it easy for readers since Granstein's writing is usually notoriously dense and segmenting the whole into its part helps to ameliorate the book's tendency towards stilted prose. Still the chapters are hardly uncomplicated, they are rife with the challenges scholars have come to expect from Granstein including new specialized vocabularies, innovative application of linguistic theory and labyrinthine explication of overarching assertions. Alright, so for your uh, uh, easiness, what I am going to do now, I am going to uh, bring all the important understanding of each chapters of comics and narration, right, as I did with the Will Astner and MacLeod, right. So what I did in Will Astner and MacLeod, like uh, I, I looked at the important points of those chapters and highlighted for you. So obviously I understand that uh, Gernstein's work is not as easy as we suppose and therefore I would humbly request to you all that don't read just one time, read at least three times and when you are reading it, read one chapter and see that the point I made in the first chapter is it what you understood and then only you are supposed to move to the next chapter. So now, I am going to present a brief summary of each chapters for your convenience, alright. So going back to the slide now, the first chapter entitled Comics and the Test of Abstraction, Gernstein examines abstract comics but further deconstruct that category into two parts, comic made up of abstract part, right abstract art and infra narrative comics or sequences of a drawing that contain figurative elements the juxtaposition of which does not produce a coherent narrative. So this kind of a comics challenges any definition of a comics that insist upon sequential narrative right. So here you see that a uh, sequential narrative is questioned, right. So, if we read this kind of a comics, we cannot understand like it goes uh, what sequential narrative is not. So, infra narrative, right, infra narrative is uh, as, I, as I told you is more about figurative element, juxtaposition of which does not produce a coherent narrative and for, for, for necessary condition to be a sequential narrative is that it should uh, in coherence, right. But infra narrative is talking about that it that it does not follow sequential narrative. So Gradestein does not offer his own definition to replace those he displaces, since his project is not to explain what comics are, but to test how they work. So keep in the mind because that is why particular reason why Gradestein becomes difficult, right? He becomes difficult because he does not explain what comics are. So once we understand that his writing to make us understand how they work, then I think we can understand it. So the lack of revised definition is not a failure, nonetheless it might frustrate scholars accustomed to more determinate, determinate criticism. So see, I mean uh, when we are reading Radistin before I move to the next chapter like I would like to say that the problem is that as I, uh, I, I have been uh, talking about this that we have certain assumptions why this is not like this, why this is not like this, why this is this. Understand that Granstein what he is doing that he is bringing a new perspective altogether. He is not bothered about the age old question but rather he is concerned about what is happening, how are we going to look at the comics, how does it work. 
So once we understand that he is trying to answer something else, not what you are expecting, possibly we will be able to understand. All right. So the next chapter on the slide that you see is new insights into sequentiality that further chips at traditional definition of a comics. Here, Gernstein notes the infrequency but not impossibility of a narrative in single panel cartoons which may convey meaning but in most cases cannot narrate a beginning, middle and end. In the third chapter titled a few theory of page layout, however, he moves away from efforts to dismantle definition of a comics and towards ways to better understand how they work. The first of these ways is through the examination of the panel itself or rather the panel as it relates to other panel on a page. Gernstein identifies four degrees of a panel layout dependent on consistency in number, height, width and density. Using this classification, Gernstein generally privileges comics with a greater regularity over those with less, arguing that more varied layout are disruptive from the point of view of the reader and typically less conductive to meaning making. He does allow that some artists are capable incorporating irregular layouts, effectively citing Chris Ware's innovative style as the preeminent example. And here comes the fourth chapter that is titled as an extension of uh, some theoretical propositions that returns to the identification of uh, rules and exceptions taking under consideration children's comics, Soho manga and interactive digital comics as forms that complicate definition of a uh, comics. While each of these forms, Granistein assures the reader shares with classically defined comics certain areas of artistic inquiry, their incorporation of devices like layout, irregularity, animation and sound begs the question of whether they are comics per se or an altogether new medium. Gernstein gets to the heart of his project in the chapter number 5 and that is titled The Question of the Narrator. He first separates the concept of a narration in comics from that of the narration in prose literature, explaining that each medium has its own enunciative mechanism and consequently a distinct narratological configuration. As such, Granstein revises the tenets of narration for a, a comics application, identifies two distinctive types of a narration, the reciter which voices the details of a story and the more abstracted monstrator an instance responsible for the rendering the story into drawn form. Altogether, the reciter and the monstrator are components of a narrative trinity in which both combine to form a third ultimate narrator responsible for storytelling overall. So, within the framework of this amalgam, other narrators can also exist. Granstein is carefully to note that some comics employ a first person narrating character for instance while in case of autobiographical comics the author himself may operate as a narrator those are termed actorlized narrators and Granstein explored their implication through examples like Marjanis Satrapi's Persepolis right. So chapter number 6 the subjectivity of the character the title if you see that interestingly why these two chapters are important, the one chapter that is chapter number 5, uh, the question of the narrator and the chapter number 6, the subjectivity of the character because this is where we are going to get a new perspective like look at the chapter number 7, the subjectivity of the character, right. He is talking about that how, see color to indicate a character's dream and fantasies in the wordless wild pilgrimage, right. So, the dream will be told to you or explained to you or articulated to you via color, right. This is something new coming up. So, here we see in the chapter number 7 that is entitled the rhythm of a comics, Gernstein returns to his earlier discussion of a layout to draw comparison between comics and music. The beat of a comic he contends is determined primarily by panel size and density 
with pages comprising many smaller panels having a faster rhythm than those with a fewer larger panels this chapter is borrowing of a musical vocabularies leads nicely into Granstein's discussion of a comic relationship to the other art right <clears throat> so here you see in the chapter number 8 is a comics a branch of a contemporary art here Granstein closes the book with an exploration of the ways in which comics have been subjected to comparison with other art forms and an insistence that such comparison are inappropriate. While comics may share an experimental spirit with contemporary art, he explains they operate in a completely different art world of economic, cultural and sociological system. So, in the chapter number, uh, I mean in, in like in comics and narration, Grunstein's project is not so much to define, understand this is a very uh, important point to understand uh, uh, what comics and narration is, what the book is all about. It is not so much to define comics as to complicate the process of defining comics. The book is successful in that regard. It does have some problematic tendencies. The first, the problem and limitation that we have of this book that Grunstein's steadfast commitment to devising a new vocabularies for comics analysis can become unnecessarily arduous, right? That's the one limitations. If comic scholars already have a language for understanding abstracts and for instance, uh, and, and they do, so why do we need to uh, get to uh, know new vocabularies, right? So, uh, uh, so Grandstein himself shows in his critiques of comic scholarship these are like these things. It seems superfluous and somewhat elitist to reinvent that particular wheel. The second limitation that we have of comics and narration, in order to really understand what is at stake in comics and narration, one must already be familiar with the system of a comics. For the former is in every way an extension of the later, right? So, this is not a problem in and of itself. It is hardly unusual for an author to write a follow-up to an earlier publication. But systems complexities does pose a readability challenge that might discourage some scholars from engaging with either volume. To Granstein's credit, he seems aware of the readability problem in system and he attempts to correct some of them in its successor by offering clarification of how the new book remedies those problem in each chapter. These elucidations are quite productive and as a result, comics and narration is probably the best to use as an addendum to the system of a comics. On the whole, the book is useful and provocative and its prose is for the most part accessible. This last point may be partly owing to Ann Miller's translation, but it is certainly also a consequence of the book situation as an outgrowth of an existing theory rather than the beginning of whole new way of understanding comics, right? So, that is where I would like to end uh, the contribution made by Gernsteins and his uh, entire uh, books. So, uh, here what I did, I mean in this uh, last few lectures in fact, I was talking about the major contribution made by Granstein's uh, book, two books that we discussed, uh, one obviously we know and the second one is comics and narrations, right. So, what is significant for us is that how these people are exploring the idea of a comics. And how are the ways they are suggesting for us so that we can indulge in reading comics very differently and what it offers to us, right? So, for this we are going to remember Granstein and obviously as a scholar we should never forget the contribution made by Granstein, alright? So, in the next class we are going to meet one important significant new person which means that we have not discussed so far he is as important as Granstein is is Bart Beatty right so in the next class we are going to talk about Bart Beatty 
and then also we'll discuss graphic novels all right so for this i'll end this class here see you in the next lecture have a, a good life and time all right bye bye see you take care